Well, I'd like to thank uh, Brian Berkey, our president, for um, suggesting this idea of a year-end HNS town hall to invite all membership to come together to hear an update of what the society has been doing this year. And um, we really want to focus on giving an opportunity to members to ask questions, make suggestions, give feedback. So um, I ask everybody to put their comments and questions into the Q&A, and we will respond either right away in writing or direct it to a panelist or in the discussion towards the end. We've reserved about 25 minutes for discussion at the end, so please feel feel liberal with your, with your questions and suggestions. Um, and we will make sure that all questions get answered um, uh, later in a PDF if we don't get to all of them in the hour that we have allotted. We'll start with a report from our president, and then I will give an update on section activities, and then each of the division directors will give an update on the um, on the priorities and the activities of their divisions over the course of the last year, with an emphasis on raising um, <clears throat> provocative questions and issues that they would like to have the input of general membership on. So really this time is for us to come together at the end of the year and reflect on where we've been and where we're going and to get input from our membership. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Berkey. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, so first of all, let me say it, it's uh, an honor to, you know, be about halfway through my presidential year um, and really facilitate the great work that's going on uh, throughout the society. We have, um, first of all, thank you to BSC, our support staff, um, the management team who've really facilitated uh, the work of all the membership and, and our great leaders today or who are here on this call and um, also uh, have been active throughout the year. So um, just wanna give a quick update on where we are. Again, we're about halfway through the presidential year. It's a little bit longer presidential year because our international meeting is in the summer. Um, I do wanna you know, we'll we'll hear from uh, Dr. Gorin about that, but uh, just excited about our international meeting in Montreal and uh, partnering with the uh, AACR. So it's almost a whole week long conference when you count that. So please come to all or part of that in uh, beautiful Montreal in the summer. Um, we have a lot of things going on. You'll hear about them tonight. I'll keep this simple. We are still continuing our partnership with Stand Up to Cancer. Um, we awarded our first grant funding, and I think that this will really increase the awareness in, in the public about the American Head and Neck Society and the work we do um, and the diseases that we treat. Um, the executive committee, as you might remember, had a big retreat that uh, Dr. Verda Malley led in February of um, earlier this year, 2022. And uh, really a lot of my presidential years just carrying out the, the deliverables from that meeting. So we set up four working groups um, looking at uh, first mission values and uh, vision. And uh, actually I'll report that out for uh, Amy uh, Chen who is unable to be here, but uh, as part of the DEI division update. The uh, non-surgical working group, that is how we interact and integrate more fully the non-surgeons um, who treat head and neck cancer into our society is in process. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bob Ferris is leading that and that's in process, uh, more to come later. The journal working group, we did decide to, you know, there's some talk about creating our own journal. We decided not to, but to, um, partner with uh, a journal we're completing. So that initial phase is completed. Now we're in phase two of um, sending out uh, opportunities for journals to um, give us um, really their vision for how they might help the American Head and Neck Society get the uh, research out to its members and to the public. So that's in phase two. Well, um, more to come, but our uh, contract with the with JAMA Odo um, is uh, ending uh, at the end of this year. 
or at the end of next year. Um, we also have a marketing working group that we're just trying to figure out how, again, to raise the public's awareness of the American Head and Neck Society and the work that we do. Uh, and that's being led by Bernard Malley. And, and the initial phase is completed. We're finalizing a formal recommendation. So again, more to come, but a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Continuing our work with international colleagues, uh, with panels during their in-person meetings around the world through different members. Um, but uh, remember that IFNOS has a big meeting coming up in Rome and many of our uh, leaders and members will be there and speaking. Um, so again, just raising our awareness and our impact across the world. Um, we're continuing educational webinars uh, and, uh, and, and trying to, uh, again, get educational programs out there. Um, last couple things, um, we are trying to develop ways to create an advanced leadership opportunities within the American Head and Neck Society when we reorganized a couple of years ago into our current structure, we realized that many of our members uh, were just not getting leadership opportunities um, that we wanted. And so we're, we're trying to figure out ways to continue to advance those leadership opportunities. Um, uh, and one other thing that we've done, uh, again, behind the scenes, to some extent, um, there have been multiple discussions about the best way to uh, continue the ATC fellowship training. Uh, right now, we're just uh, to be perfectly transparent, we're maintaining the status quo. That's our plan. Um, but we're always trying to uh, improve the quality and the mentorship within the ATC fellowships around the country. Finally, we uh, have a new job board. And um, I think that's a great membership benefit uh, that. Uh, people uh, that, that institutions and organizations around the country can post job opportunities on our job board and we can then sign up for those. So um, our members can, can um, interact with those. And so that is um, just open. So please keep an eye out if you're looking for um, employment, uh, finishing up or looking for a move, uh, then please uh, keep an eye on that. And so a lot of good things happening. I'll leave it there and um, can't, uh, can't wait to hear from our membership and our leadership during this call. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, next slide. Oh, so <clears throat> this is my secretary's report, next. I would like to remind everybody to please post and subscribe to our blog, Heads Up, at that link. And um, we continue to send out monthly emails highlighting what's new on the HNS website. Um, next slide. One of my greatest <clears throat> pleasures in serving as secretary of the society is working with all of the sections. And here I have just, um, in pictorial fashion, displayed our current leadership of the six sections that we have. The sections were really designed to represent um, disease sites, topics, areas of specialization to cover the, the spectrum of our specialty. Next. <clears throat> and for our year-end reflections, um, as we enter what I like to call our gentle December, I sent out just a simple query. I wanted to know, what is your section happiest about in 2022? What is your section most hopeful about for 2023? What is the most pressing issue for your section right now? And what is the number one item on your section's wish list? And I got really thoughtful um, and, and quite succinct answers that identified um, several areas of uh, common interest around engagement, feedback on programming, collaboration with external societies and organizations, ease of scheduling um, and longitudinal projects. And so I just briefly want to hit the highlights for, um, for these four questions going forward. So next. So what have people been the happiest about this year? <clears throat> and I got a little carried away this morning with color coding on the common theme. So don't fret too much about that, but engagement is an overwhelming theme. So um, 
One of the key things is engagement, not just of the regular and active um, members of the section, but engaging, getting new members and engaging them and learning how to negotiate the mix of people who are really active in the section and those who really enjoy the fellowship of the section, but may not have the time or commitment to be very active in the project. So cutaneous mentioned endocrine, endocrine, or sorry, cutaneous and endocrine, um, the pre-conference courses for Montreal were a highlight for several um, several of the sections, uh, and a couple of the sections had big projects that they've gotten underway. The mucosal section um, has a CT DNA liquid biopsy task force. Um, the recon section did their four-part reconstruction around the world series. Um, salivary section completed a multi-center study with 25 centers. 600 patients on adjuvant radiation for low-grade salivary cancer, and the skull-based section established the Sinonasal Tumor Alliance between ARS, NS, NASBS, and HNS, which is a, a model example of collaboration across sister societies. Next. Most hopeful, again, we see that while many of the sections were very happy with their level of engagement, um, many were also really optimistic that they could improve that in the new year. Again, looking at people who are already active, keeping them engaged, and then how to get especially junior members um, of the society interested and engaged. Um, webinar development and increased engagement around the international meeting were highlights. And again, the salivary section has a pre-conference course coming in Montreal, which they're very proud of. Um, and again, collaborative overlap of the um, of the related uh, societies for skull base. Next, the most pressing issue, and this is where it kind of drills down into the things that are immediately and substantively relevant for the the subject matter of the section. So, the cutaneous malignancy section is <clears throat> very focused on being at the forefront of the development of dermato oncology and gaining more, um, more visibility at national conferences. Uh, the endocrine section is looking towards um, core resources for shared database, such as REDCap, to allow, um, to allow collaborative and multi-institutional research enterprises from the different sections. Um, a repeating theme is the anticipation of the um, guidelines for guidelines is our nickname for it, but the, um, the rubric for uh, consensus statements and uh, clinical practice guidelines to give the sections more um, focus and clarity on what the expectations are there. Again, engagement um, was a shared theme. And finally, number one on the wish list. Next. Cutaneous hopes for more airtime at national meetings for cutaneous cancer from our meeting and other meetings. Endocrine really hopes for clarity and ease of scheduling events and proactive calendaring, a new verb for me, but I like it a lot. I plan to use it a lot in the new year. Um, the mucosal section wants to establish um, a subgroup for um, robotics to give uh, those specialists a place to have initiatives and feedback. Um, one common theme that came up was seeking more feedback on uh, topics for submissions, criteria for selection for live meetings and virtual events, um, and then feedback on the events after they happen. And we've proposed a gap analysis to help assess um, what members want to know about and what, um, what they need to know about. Again, more feedback on submissions and selection criteria streamlined website development and communication in online formats like Slack. And finally, last slide, the common themes. Okay, so what can we do about engagement? And I think the two things that came out were just the success of using Slack for channels and subchannels for online communication, and then pathways for more and less active section members so that those who don't have the ability to be more active can still be, feel engaged and productive within the section. Um, and those who are more active don't feel you know, prevailed upon um, or overworked because I think there's really space for both. And I really welcome input and suggestion from the members on the call about how they'd like to be engaged with the sections. Uh, feedback on programming, and I think, you know, the gap analysis gives us a starting point, but I think understanding better our live meeting selection criteria, 
virtual event selection and scheduling, and then the guidelines for the guidelines. Collaboration with other entities is emerging as increasingly important, both with our non-surgical specialties and our sister surgical specialties. And the h &S will be revisiting its policies on co-sponsorship and endorsement to make those clearer and more proactive. Ease of scheduling and sharing work products, looking at websites, video availability, and calendaring. And finally, just recognizing the work that goes into the longitudinal projects, um, which may not happen every year for a section, but every couple of years, um, the work that goes into these can really achieve remarkable fruition. So I, I can't tell you how excited I am to be part of this, and I welcome questions and suggestions and feedback on section activities, because this is really where the work of the society gets done. And that is it for me. I will then move on to um, the administrative division. Greg Randolph. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Brian and Susan. Uh, very happy to be part of this uh, get together. And I think it's amazing the society needs a webinar and a town hall to describe all of the different activities going on, which is just, it's, it's very, very exciting. Uh, 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 Christina, I think you have my slides there. This is the first one. The administrative division is a, a conglomeration of different important services that are all uh, described here and, and uh, the leadership of these societies. We appreciate their active work throughout the year. I, you you can see their names and so forth. Uh, please, I'll I'll try and within five minutes or less, just uh, briefly take a little bit of a tour through here. Uh, the the administrative division has also been working with Johan Fagan and um, Amy Chen uh, and Melanie in the DEI a division to uh, help to construe a new international advisory service, which is really. Uh, uh, designed on a format that has been successful with, within the AAO with nine new regions designated, and they'll be North American and local regional leaders helping to lead each of those sections. So that's a very robust uh, bureaucracy that will be set up to mediate international relationships. Uh, there is a new corporate liaison group, a, a partnering or a gathering of our corporate partners to coordinate ongoing discussions and head next society support in addition to annual meeting and research support that exists from these partners and some interesting pipeline uh, discussions will be mediated through that group and this is still in the planning stages. And then the white paper initiative, or I like, Sue, the, what you had described, I think increasingly is described as the guidelines initiative for guidelines, it, not just guidelines, but white papers in general. And I want to briefly uh, review that the information will be coming out soon. It's been a very multi faceted process involving people, budgets, methodologists, uh, reviewing different organizational approaches to this sort of thing, having a range of white papers that range from the uh, uh, lower level evidence-based uh, papers that many of our members are uh, able to write now, and also including true consensus statements and Guide, true guidelines, evidence-based uh, grade type guidelines uh, that we will endeavor towards over the next several years. And there's a budgetary line to the to many of those uh, 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 initiatives within the white paper initiative. Next slide. Uh, we're very pleased, especially about Andy Schumann's work on the Moral Injury uh, Project, which is a mentoring group that you will hear about that has just now been moving through the organization and has been approved. And there will be additional uh, programming introducing everyone to this, but it's a very well thought out. And I think human uh, uh, member value that Andy is pioneering uh, through the ethics uh, service and uh, more to come from him. Um, but I think really, really helpful. And I really think it, it shows the society as a group of friends and colleagues uh, who are available to help each other with the inevitable challenges that we all face. Um, next slide. The white paper initiative, again, this involves uh, first and foremost people. And so we are adding to our initial volunteer group, a uh, group that have proven published methodologic skills. We've 
been fortunate today. Actually, I enlisted the third and final leader of this group. We'll have renowned national leaders who are um, willing to provide leadership to the uh, group uh, uh, that we have uh, within the existing guideline service and now our new group of methodologic experts that uh, we have uh, garnered through uh, evaluating the membership rosters of the Head and Neck Society. There's quite a number of people who have very substantial expertise. This group will be uh, gathered and led by Baron Sumner and uh, by these other methodologists. And uh, this will allow us to really move into the um, the upper level of the white papers in terms of true cons clinical consensus statements and clinical practice guidelines, which is really, I think, a organizational landscape type event. Uh, what will bring us uh, in line with other organizations like AAAS and ATA and other organizations whose value and member value is in large part uh, involved the uh, practice guidelines and consensus statements that they publish. Uh, next slide. This involves also uh, the uh, budget and the budget involves, you know, you nowadays for guidelines and clinical consensus statements, you need to uh, involve uh, methodologic experts in addition to the volunteers that we have outlined on the previous slide. Also, we um, are looking in item three there at having this new uh, group of existing volunteers in the guideline service and new experts that we're bringing in. Uh, we hope that this is a, a union uh, or a grouping that will provide not only white paper oversight, but also mentoring in the white paper clinical consensus statement and guidelines space. Uh, and so some of our budgetary items are uh, looking at the um, at the um, at the um, uh, uh, budgetary item that relates to uh, bringing people to the guidelines uh, international meetings, uh, so that the uh, more experienced people can mentor more junior people. So I hope that this group to be a sought after place for Head and Neck Society members to learn uh, uh, methodologic expertise and give us uh, plant some seeds for future guidelines work. Next slide. And again, uh, we will review this. I'm not going to take much time today, but we have contemporary review and position paper, papers, which are the lower evidence-based white papers that will, I think, allow uh, expression of the current uh, writing initiatives within many of the sections. But we'll also have a proposal submitted for clinical consensus statement and clinical practice guidelines. This is a limited number of, in, of uh, topics will be selected by this group and offered up to the EC moving forward. Next slide. Uh, okay, that's uh, everything. Uh, there'll be more to come. Actually, Sue will be very uh, formative in uh, once we have all of those final steps, budgetary and so forth, clarified, Sue will be uh, creating a round of town halls with the sections to in a very granular way, introduce the definitions of those white papers and how you submit different ideas and so forth and what's available in our new guidelines for guidelines initiative. So thank you everyone, Sue and Brian especially, and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Greg. Um, unfortunately, uh, Amy has had a death in the family is not able to be with us, but Brian will present her update on the diversity, equity and inclusion division. Right, and thank you. Uh, and also, Melanie, unfortunately, I was not able to be here. So one of the presidential task force that we talked about earlier was um, kind of through the DEI and updating mission vision uh, statements. And so this is our new approved uh, mission vision. So the mission, uh, or excuse me, mission statement, the mission of the American Head Next Society is to advance education research quality of care and equity for both the head and neck oncology patient and the care team. Um, and I think that, remember the uh, division of DEI is relatively new, about a year old. And so this kind of represents our um, uh, embrace of that initiative uh, throughout the organization. And then our updated values are for excellence, innovation, inclusion, and community. Next slide. Um, these are the services within DEI. And I'll just go and go ahead and next slide, um, go through quickly 
some of the ongoing activities, which include webinars, a mentorship program, of course, the Myers Summer Fellowship and the Butler Award. Next slide. Um, these are really, uh, I think, summarizes many of the new activities, and that's what we're focusing on uh, tonight um, of DEI. So there's the Eddie Mendez Fellowship Award. Um, Greg uh, had already talked about the International Fellows and Young Physicians Group, which is um, being organized and invigorated. The job board that I mentioned earlier is up, so please, I hope our uh, you know younger members and members in transition use that. I hope it's a, a good resource. Please let us know. Um, we did recently remove the FACS requirement for active fellows within our society. We hope that that makes it a little bit easier and less costly to be part of the society. Um, we know that that kind of changes a little bit the um, uh, the the kind of the tradition of the society, but we thought it was necessary um, to kind of keep the society fresh and young. Um, and uh, the HNS, speaking of young, does have the Young Members Corner podcast. Uh, two are currently up. And uh, finally, uh, we have the Moral Injury Peer Support Program that uh, Greg Randolph uh, spoke about. It's actually being kind of jointly sponsored by both um, the uh, DEI uh, division and the administrative uh, division. Next slide. Um, we talked briefly about the two fellowship awards. Next slide. And uh, the Global Outreach Service uh, has had a very successful webinar with uh, international colleagues in Africa and Haiti earlier this year. Um, the HNS now participates in regularly scheduled African tumor boards, which is, I think, a unique uh, opportunity for us and, and for the African otolaryngologists, head and neck surgeons. Uh, you can see some upcoming events. Next slide. All these slides, incidentally, and a recording of the broadcast will be available on the website, so you don't have to take notes or think you're missing anything. Um, I think we talked mainly about this already. Next slide. Um, the job board is up, as we said. Current membership now is around 2,000, so uh, we have you know, probably um, over 800 active members within the U.S. and the rest internationally, so it really is an international society. Next slide. Um, women in head and neck surgery uh, is excited to have a panel submission in 2023. Um, that is the challenges and opportunities in addressing underrepresented yeah. surgeons uh, and uh, some future podcasts with women's leaders. Um, also, obviously, the Margaret Butler Award, for which I think nominations just opened up, and uh, the mentorship program, which remains active. Next slide. Uh, I think we discussed this uh, about young members, but particularly for young members, there's the HNS podcast that we talked about, um, but also a uh, Zoom webinar on practice building, which particularly some of the younger members may enjoy and find valuable. Next slide. And that's it. And Amy and any of us, of course, are welcome to take your uh, questions. Uh, okay. Thank you, Susan. Terrific. Thank you, Brian. We'll move on now to Chris Gorin, who's the chair of the education division. Hi, thank you. And um, thank you to everybody for attending. I'll just give you a brief overview of some of the activities we've been working on this year. Next slide. So you all know the organizational structure where the education division fits in is that there are sections under directly uh, encompassed by education. Um, next slide. The Advanced Training Council, CME, Curriculum Development, Scientific Program, and also Patient and Public Education, and so we'll touch on those. And that doesn't count all the sections that were alluded to previously, whose work falls under all of these larger buckets. Next slide. So, um, you know, primary, or I shouldn't say primarily, but the American Head and Neck Society prides itself on being the premier organization responsible for head and neck surgical oncologic care, which increasingly is not just surgical care, but multidisciplinary care. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do accredit fellowships with it that, special, that stipulate advanced head and neck <laughs> oncologic training. Next slide. 
Um, we offer three different, we oversee three different types of fellowships. The, um, the clinical head and neck surgical experience, and these fellowships can be a purely ablative or ablative and reconstructive. Um, there's also increasing numbers of head and neck endocrine specific fellowships. And as you know, not all the fellowships are the same. Uh, some have strengths um, in areas such as cranial base surgery and tours. Uh, many of the fellowships that we accredit off also offer the opportunity for research. Next slide. And so the mission of the um, Advanced Training Council is again to approve fellowships that actually meet the educational requirements of trainees who are committed to academic careers in head and neck surgical oncology. And as a result, these fellowships must provide comprehensive training adequate volumes, exposure to all the other disciplines that make up the multidisciplinary team. Next slide. The uh, accredited head and neck fellowships uh, encompass 51 programs and a total of 66 fellowships. Uh, some of the fellowships, uh, some programs offer more than one fellowship, such as endocrine, in addition to head and neck. And some programs have more than one uh, fellow, but you can see this is the distribution of academic programs offering fellowships. Next slide. If we look at the match results from this year, you can see that 15% of HS fellowship programs went unfilled. Only 6% of applicants went mm -hmm. unmatched. Um, and again, if you look at this number of positions unfilled, it's nine slots. Well, we have 66 programs with 51, uh, 66 fellowships from 51 programs. And so this is almost an equal number, meaning that I interpret this as a one-to-one -one match. So we may actually have had this year more slots than we had applicants. Um, Canada did not suffer this problem, 100% of their slots, but we're talking about a small number of programs there. Um, next slide. The Advanced Training Council is uh, currently in the process of a site visit for a new program, the University of Arkansas, pending ATC review. There were six new program directors approved this past year, um, and uh, a new initiative with the International Advisory Board for the HNS International Fellows and Young Physician Group um, is working with our programs. In the past year, Loma Linda University's fellowship became approved, and there were a number of programs that were reaccredited since the last meeting. Next slide. And uh, one of the um, tenets of the Advanced Training Council is, or, or the AHNS, is that the ATC revisits programs to make sure that they continue to uh, meet the criteria that we set out for what what's what sets our fellowships apart and so you can see the atc has been very busy in the last two years since the onset of the pandemic uh, with all these site visits either completed or in progress next slide finally these are the results of a survey that the atc sent out to uh, academic programs that participate in uh, hns accredited fellowships and so this shows the distribution on the left is that the majority of respondents were program directors, but also included department chairs and practicing um, surgeons. And so um, just over half of the respondents um, completed an HS accredited fellowship. This may reflect the fact that not all programs, some of us on this call remember, were accredited programs years ago. Uh, most respondents have been in practice for um, uh, at least five years with the majority slanting uh, even more so. And then the question of, um, you know, alluding to what we've heard about in our pediatric uh, otolaryngology world about subspecialty certification. The question was asked, do we want to explore other options for our fellowship programs, such as, uh, as an examination? And as you can see, next slide. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't highlight. You can go back one. Um, the bottom box here shows that the majority of respondents um, voted to continue the certification as it currently yeah. is implemented. So we'll continue to talk about such issues as Dr. Jaberke alluded to, but there are no change, ch there are no plans to offer a subspecialty exam. Next slide. The CME section of the education division has been very active with webinars, as well as um, the scientific program you'll hear more about. Next slide. 
We are sensitive to the gap analysis put forth by the different sections. And um, you know, with the onset of the pandemic, uh, the AHNS was very active in an online uh, presence. And so we, we hosted, as I'll show you shortly, a lot of webinars. And the webinar is here to stay. It's been well received. Um, you can receive additional training in CME from the comfort of your own home. Uh, but we are sensitive to the fact that um, there has to be a process for selecting a topic that makes uh, a, a acceptable webinar. What needs does this address? And so this activity planning worksheet was developed this year, which addresses gaps in knowledge, uh, addresses you know what the focus of the webinar would be, and, and basically gives it some more formality so that sections have um, a format to follow when they apply. Next slide. Webinars are new to this um, um, society. Again, with the onset of the pandemic, um, our um, society should be commended for really ramping up the online presence. And we offered a lot of webinars in 2020. Um, and you can see that attendance was actually quite high. Um, and um, the middle column is attendees online. But look at the YouTube views. When these remained in perpetuity available online, we had many more views um, than we did the online attendance because people may not be able to make that time. And you can see that in 2020, Sinonasal and uh, RFI of thyroid nodules was a hot topic um, with the most attendees and YouTube views. Um, and if you look at 2020, it was extra capsular spread and tours. Next slide. We are sensitive to um, uh, Zoom fatigue. We all have a lot of obligations. And so we've been careful to um, not overload our membership with too many choices. Uh, there are two more boards that meet, there are journal clubs that meet, and um, so dedicated webinars need to fit a need and also need to represent all of the different sections of the society and not over-represent one or two. So we have selected um, uh, two a month, and that's in addition to the tumor board, and you can see the distribution <laughs> here. Um, the largest number of attendees by far were for the sinonasal cancer webinars and the TORS webinars. And um, in 2023, we have slots filled through June. And again, we're trying to get equal representation from all of the sections being sensitive to members' um, wants. Next slide. Finally, you heard Dr. Randolph allude to this, and Greg Farwell, this falls under your division, so he may speak about it more, but um, we've talked a lot in the last year about what constitutes a publication that should be endorsed by the American Head and Neck Society. We are blessed with very active and engaged membership that often generates publications from the results of their endeavors. And so um, a lot of uh, thought has gone into what constitutes a, uh, a contemporary, an actual contemporary review versus a practice guideline. And Dr. Randolph alluded to these, but these guidelines will be available on the web. Um, and there's been a lot of work put into clearly stipulating, but not just what we think, but what does the literature call a clinical management consensus statement? What is a position paper? Um, Again, these are topics that will be identified by the actual sections or membership themselves who can propose an idea uh, and then submit the topic to the education division, which will vote to approve the topic. Um, and then there are formal process guidelines to follow. And lastly, uh, CME has um, uh, really been focused on the international meeting in Montreal next year, and the CME service has been very active in um, reviewing disclosures, putting together the planning committee, the program committee, and the review committee, and we're currently reviewing abstracts right now. Next slide. As Dr. Berkey mentioned, this meeting will be held July 8th through 12th in Montreal, which is a gorgeous time of the year to be there. And you know, this is our crown jewel meeting that we hold every four years. Lots of opportunities for people to become engaged. Next slide. This is the overall program. Um, the AACR will be meeting on um, Saturday, and I'll show you that information in a minute, um, and Friday as well. But you can see that our program primarily begins on Saturday with instructional courses, and the main programs uh, occupying multiple rooms will be Sunday through Wednesday. The keynote ne lectures have been announced, um, and you can see this here. And um, next slide. And finally, the AACR conference will uh, dovetail with the Montreal in Mont will meet in Montreal also and meet just the day before the HNS meeting starts. Joe Califano, Maura Gillison, Sana Karam, and Jose Savalos 
our conference co-chairs for this meeting, which begins on uh, Friday. And with that, that concludes the division report. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of slide, didn't I? I was following a different, okay. No. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. That was a terrific overview of a really key part of the HNS activities. So we are just a little over halfway through, and we have one question in the Q&A. So I encourage everybody to reflect on what's been said so far and enter their questions and comments, else we will have a lot of discussion on, on the Slack channel utilization. And we have still um, patient care and research divisions to go. So I will turn it over to Dr. Farwell for patient care update. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. McKenna, and just happy holidays to everyone. Um, on behalf of my co-chair, Carol Fockery, I just want to thank the leadership and all of the members of the services under the patient care division. It's been a very active year. Uh, next slide, please. So the Cancer uh, Prevention Service uh, under the leadership of Mike Moore, Ann Gillenwater and Andrew Holcomb have put on some very successful webinars. Uh, they've also launched a head and neck self-examination app uh, that will be useful for our patients and have participated in vaccination roundtables in the American Cancer Society on HPV. Going forward for the rest of the year, they're gonna be working with AMWA on some global initiatives against HPV and Cervical Cancer Awareness Week. Um, there's a call that will go out soon for the Community Service Awards, and they continue their close work with the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance. Next slide. The um, Practice Guidelines and Physician Statement Service, uh, we've heard an awful lot about this. There was a lot of great work that happened during the pandemic and continues. Uh, really a big hat tip to Greg Randolph. He's done a tremendous amount of work in organizing and setting us up to be real leaders in this field with uh, a contemporary and evidence-based approach to our literature. So Baron Summer and Ted Gomez will be working closely with the team that Greg Randolph is um, putting together. And I think this will really become a shining jewel of our society's productivity. Next slide, please. The survivorship and supportive care and rehabilitation service uh, have also been extremely busy. They put on a very successful survivorship symposium this summer with tons of attendees, great feedback as you might expect. And they're in the process of putting together multiple webinars for 2023 on a full range of uh, topics that you can see listed here. Planning is already underway for the third annual Head and Neck Cancer Survivorship Symposium uh, in October in partnership with the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance. Next slide. Just a reminder, these were the announced Community Service Award winners for 2022. Uh, and as mentioned in the near future, the call will be going out for the 2023 um, applications. And then final slide. Our uh, value and quality of care service has also been very busy. Uh, Vasu Devi and Evan Grayboys I've been working closely uh, around the American College of Surgeons uh, Commission on Cancer uh, initiative, looking at timely delivery of radiation therapy. Uh, they have a cohort of about 45 sites that are looking at uh, current state of the uh, delivery of radiation care and going through a very sophisticated process on setting up a quality uh, assessment of our delivery of care and radiation therapy in a timely manner. So. Lots of great work. Uh, Susan, I will turn it back over to you. Terrific, thank you. And our uh, final division, uh, research, Jim Rocco. Uh, thanks everyone and uh, welcome everyone. So, you know, just briefly, uh, the research division uh, really oversees all research activities of society, including grants, programs, scientific review, <laughs> research awards. Uh, what I would say is, you know, I have the pleasure of presenting this, but it's a huge amount of work from uh, the heads of the different services, Barry Wenig, Joseph Curry, Jeff Liu, uh, Sufi Thomas, Jose Zavallis, and Steve Chen. So I get the pleasure of presenting all their work, plus all the work of the mentors. Uh, next slide. So just a couple things, just to remind everyone, the, the, the research committee is uh, very involved with the core, the HNS core and uh, a huge amount of funding, all those different grants, 
And I would just advise everyone who's on the call who's interested in serving on the core to reach out to the uh, research division. I think it's a really amazing opportunity. Many funded scientists, clinician scientists started with core grants. Um, and then reviewing on cores is really great practice if you're in the process of writing an IH grant. Uh, earlier, Brian mentioned about the HNS retreat. Uh, the research division was very involved with the, the concept of grants, um, really a huge amount of work. Uh, Sherry and Nathan and Dennis Krauss, uh, tremendously helpful. But we had the result where we increased the value of uh, our grant awards that you could see there under um, our results. Um, and ideally, maybe still pending in the future, we'd like to get see if we can get that matched by the AAO HNSF. We'll have to see where that leads. Next slide. Um, Population Health and Clinical Research Service, Chair Barry Wenig and Joseph Curry. Uh, just a couple highlights from them. Recently completed HNS webinar and immunotherapy clinical trials, as well as uh, three infographics designed and posted on the HNS social media this year. There's an upcoming webinar on population health, a panel for HNS uh, 2023 accepted on immunotherapy and head and neck cancer, uh, clinical trials and research, and collaborative multidisciplinary study on impact of COVID and head and neck cancer. Uh, that project in in process. Next slide. The basic science and translational research, Jeff Liu and Sufi Thomas, they did an infographic on circulating tumor DNA, which was posted on Twitter. They have two more infographics in progress, and then they're doing a lot of uh, meeting and science planning for the ACR and HNS in 2023 in Montreal. That's an example of one of their infographics. Next slide. Finally, uh, just a little change, HNS survey service. The survey group, many of you participate with this. They've kind of had a hard time finding a home. They kind of started in the research group, have kind of shopped around and then kind of circled full back. Uh, Jeff Liu has done a tremendous amount of work with that over the years. So he's kind of stepping down, but going to oversee. And John Delamita is going to come up. Uh, many of you have made, may have seen an email go out recently, but um, they are soliciting sections and divisions for reviewers to help with surveys. So uh, volunteer reviewers are appreciated. So with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. I think we've seen a, you know, a rich representation of what the what the divisions um, are doing from the top top down leadership um, with their services and some of the priorities from the sections. Um, I'd like to um, turn now to questions and suggestions from the audience. Um, for the panelists, first, um, how is the the Slack channel imagined to be utilized? Um, and since that's sort of a section oriented report, I can just share that it's um, it's designed to be an online uh, communication thread, much like ENT Connect for the Academy or ACS Communities for the um, for the ACS. Um, it's been most robustly utilized by the recon section with multiple sub channels so that people can sort of uh, come together and talk and share ideas and problems and that kind of thing. And um, it's worked so well for them that they're, the other sections are interested in rolling that out. So I'll open it up to the other panelists and see if they have any feedback or suggestions about how that might be, you know, utilized. It's not really structured from the top down. It's more of a grassroots, um, grassroots initiative. Okay. If there's no other input from the panel, we'll move on to um, an education question. Um, why ban? the verb understand in objectives of educational programs, does it not require understanding to implement the desired actions? So Chris, maybe you can address that. That's a great question and it's not unique to the h &S. Probably every academic program that offers CME has to battle this. We need action words, sort of verbs and understanding can be sort of passive. So that's why the word is not encouraged for use when um, putting together the gap analysis. That was a great question though. Just seeing Susan do her air quotes twice <laughs> was worth the price of admission for this. That was great. <laughs> well, I am, um, I struggle with goals and objectives and I, you know, I have my go-to Bloom's taxonomy of like the verbs that I'm supposed to use and understanding is like level two between 
you know, basic knowledge and then like acts of creation up at the very tippy top of that pyramid. So it's not that it's not legitimate. It's just that we it's it's lower down on the pyramid. Um, so that's my understanding of it. But I I, 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 have to tell, I have to tell you when I'm when I'm writing them, I'm like, I definitely want you to understand this. So I'm not I'm not giving it up. I won't give it up entirely. <laughs> Uh, all right, Greg, this one looks like it's uh, one for you. How are white papers on different issues identified and vetted? Yeah, so this is um, the white papers are construed as four different, two lower uh, level of evidence, two higher level of evidence. The lower level uh, consensus statement, uh, the um, uh, po uh, position statement and contemporary review will be uh, 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 proposed to the guidelines advisory board, and there will be much less supervision over those. Uh, the section then, once approved, will be able to go ahead and mediate the product uh, because it'll be a very defined set of parameters, word length, number of references, lack of recommendations. It'll be a very, you'll, you'll have a recipe for what to make. Um, so there will be some acknowledgement at the Central Guidelines Advisory Board of that activity, but then it'll be a downhill slide from the section back up to the Guidelines uh, Advisory Board uh, approval, approval by the EC, and then it is a head and next society uh, 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 endorsed uh, contemporary review or um, position statement. The, um, the upper level evidence-based papers, which we have not yet uh, uh, gone to, uh, they require substantial time, substantial manpower, woman power, and a budgetary component to it. So those we will, uh, we have created forms that will be for clinical consensus statement and clinical practice guidelines proposals that Sue will present to the sections. And then those proposals will be floated back up to the guidelines advisory board they will select the ones that they think are best initially we're just hoping to pick one over the next year and a half or so as our first guidelines initiative um, and that will be then approved by the ec and then that guidelines will be the focus of the resources necessary for a true <laughs> clinical practice guidelines so there's a little bit more a lot more pre-approval for that guidelines because uh, unlike the position statements and contemporary reviews of which there may be multiple the guidelines there's only going to be one at any one time uh, and that is something that would take, you know, a year and a half or so. Thanks, Greg. I think well, Greg, I don't know, Greg Farwell, if you want to mention anything more. Um... I, I would just suggest that, um, you know, this is taking a while and we, we acknowledge that there were a lot of great ideas in the pipelines during COVID. And so, you know, I, I want to just express my understanding and apologies for the length of time to get it right. I'm so excited that when we get it right, this will be a premier product coming out of the HNS, you know, mm -hmm. akin to what the ATA guidelines have done for uh, the ATA. So um, I'm very excited about where we're heading. Yes, thank you. All right, next question. What is the HNS response to um, OMS request to be part of the American Board of Medical Specialties? What impact will that have on our decision to have a subspecialty board exam? Brian, I'm gonna send that to you. Yeah, no, thank you. Great question. Um, so a couple things first, uh, as the question alludes, uh, the American Board of or Maxillofacial Surgery has uh, sent a request to the ABMS to be a formal board. This is a you know, pretty significant process. Um, it's it's really the first time in many years that a new group has asked for a separate board. Um, uh, I, I pointed out, and there's uh, put out in a letter, uh, you know, earlier to the membership that um, everyone in the public um, is allowed to comment on this up until I think January 15th. Um, as president, I felt that we should, as a society, have a formal stand on it. So um, we actually have met, uh, just to let our membership know, we, we have met as a group, an executive group, um, already in two different sessions to discuss our formal response. We'll be 
crafting the exact response um, over the holidays um, uh, and then submitting that before the deadline, January 15th. I think a couple key things. Um, the response will focus on, uh, I think that number one, um, the board has to be, a, the suggested board has to be significantly different from other boards. Um, and, you know, we'll comment, I think that um, the scope is not entirely different from a laryngology and plastics. Um, and it will discuss you know, the public benefit um, to having a new board because that's critical. Um, and, the, and there are pros and cons to that. So uh, we will discuss that um, opportunity. Um, I, I think that also we will bear in mind that, um, just have a couple notes written, that um, the uh, sponsorship from other dental societies has not been overwhelming. Um, and that the the current board really does have several, it is a fairly divergent group. That is, um, when we look at the current board, which is um, the ABOMS is um, certified by the American Dental Association and a group associated with that, it is actually a quite diverse group of single and dual degree uh, people. So um, I think our, you know, we're, we're not obviously going to be positively um, for or against it, but I do think we want to just point out some of the opportunities um, as the ABMS suggests this. Um, and then finally, how will this affect it? Remember that this is um, way before I think it'll affect the American Head and Neck Society. So meaning that um, the ABOMS would have to be granted uh, board status in the ABMS, and only then could they apply for a subspecialty certification. Um, so um, I don't know how it's you know going to affect us. We are sensitive uh, to the fact that if such a sub subspecialty certification went through, it should hopefully go through the ABO um, HNS and supported by the American Head and Neck Society um, and not through a, a new board of the ABOMS. ABOMS. But um, we did discuss that again as a group. We didn't feel like that was um, a reason to forge ahead with a change in our uh, fellowship certification. Um, and so again, right now the HNS will not probably ask the um, ABO HNS to apply for uh, subspecialty fellowship training at the current time. This may change, it's a dynamic situation. I think we're keeping our ear to the ground and trying to keep you know, the public uh, in our highest interest and also our membership in second highest interest. So, um, but please, we appreciate um, the opinions of our membership, it does help guide our direction. So um, I hope that's helpful. Yes, I think that was an excellent summary of where we are right now. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and the final question we'll address is, uh, Academy has a political action committee. Is there an equivalent in the AHNS and how can one contribute and participate? We're at the end of the year and a time many donate philanthropically. What opportunities exist to contribute to the AHNS? A great ending note. Christina, can I call on you? Or perhaps Jim. <clears throat> Well, Hi, this is no, Christine. I'm, oh, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say um, all, all of our advocacy efforts on behalf of the HNS is actually through the academy. So we partner with them and we have representation um, on the academy board to help us with those efforts. But we do not have a separate pack um, to help with this. 
There are many opportunities, though, to contribute to the Head and Neck Society. Jim, I'm sure, can outline some of the uh, named uh, research uh, funds that are available uh, that you can really make a mark and uh, put your flag down to support uh, uh, trainees in years to come. But Jim, maybe you want to mention that? Um, sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, if anyone's interested in donating philanthropically to h &S, you know, clearly just reach out to the leadership, Susan. There's lots of different opportunities. You know, we, we have different funds that support different things and also things that we're trying to grow. You can also contribute to the foundation board, which has overall contributes to the financial stability of the h &S. And I think the h &S does a really fantastic job of that when money comes in, we try to create opportunities for uh, our members. So, you know, when, when enough money is raised on an issue, that often leads to a new grant or new opportunity. I think, Greg, you did a great job with raising these different uh, thyroid grants that now exist that a couple of years ago didn't. And that, and that was due to, you know, in, in that uh, case, corporate sponsorship. So I think, you know, what comes in is, is eventually what um, goes out. But I think Christina and, and probably Brian now as president and obviously Susan could direct people to, to the right place um, if it's something you want to establish yourself or contribute to an existing effort. Yeah, I think that the HNS uh, research and education grants are a terrific opportunity to contribute. I think if you want to do more with um, patients and survivorship, the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance, a sister society, is a great place to look. Um, we are reaching the end of our time. I would like to just say that we'll be having another town hall towards the end of January to um, discuss more issues that are pertinent to our focus practice designation. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody um, to become a member of AHNS, um, and our member benefits are listed here. And I'd like to turn it over to Brian for a closing word as our president. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Well, first of all, I'd just like to thank all the um, panel and uh, for your leadership and for your interaction tonight. It was great leadership it's fantastic working with such a wonderful group of leaders and members throughout the country and world um i do also want to thank our you know management team uh bsc and christina and jj and ocean who are on the call and i just want to wish a happy holiday and a great new year to everybody else i think this has been a nice way to end the year for the american head and neck society as a look back and um, I look forward and a way to interact and and just looking forward to a fantastic meeting <laughs> in Montreal in July. Wonderful. A happy year end to everybody and a happy new year.